SARE is so special. It's a farmer-directed grant arm from the USDA that started in 1988 with the Farm Bill because the USDA knew that farmers are always on the cutting edge to find applied solutions to their problems that they have. Lance Cray has 10 plus years of experience in farming, social expert in enterprise, and community development. He is currently the operations director of New City Neighbors, a nonprofit that provides first time youth employment to 20 plus youth through a social enterprise, three acre vegetable farm, and a farm to table cafe that makes value added soups, salads, and wood fired pizzas. All right, great. It's a uh... Good to be with my people. My farmers are always my people. It doesn't matter if you're, uh, yeah, you all know what I mean. So um, I'll share a little bit about my SARE project and um, then I'm gonna just share a little bit about our farm and some maybe some unique features of our CSA. Um, so we have actually received three SARE grants total as a, as a farm. So we've done a youth educator SARE grant. So if you're uh, trying to educate other youth about uh, what you're doing, it's a pretty easy application. We just uh, submitted one two days ago. Um, so you just missed that one, but you can go for it next year. Um, and then we've also done two SARE Farmer Rancher grants. I think those are due in December. Um, and so anytime I have a new idea on my farm, um, I, I apply for one of them because um, it's a decent amount of work. But uh, when we built a pizza oven, uh, we got a $7,500 grant to build a pizza oven. Um, and then when we uh, were doing intercropping and we thought that was unique, we got another grant to do that. And so it's a way to help pay yourself, uh, try out a new idea. And I would just say the kind of the trick is, I was just sharing with them, I think we're farmers and we don't really value our time very often. So we're like, what I really need is somebody to pay for my pizza oven. So I'll, I'll show you the trick. That's what I needed. Um, but the way I kind of tricked the system um, was I did a, a, a workshop on how to build a pizza oven on your farm. And then I posted that, and then we had other farmers come out and check that out. We did a YouTube video on it, and then we built our pizza oven. And then we had money to do that, but I asked, I asked for money to pay for my time to build a pizza oven. And for like time to travel, to talk to you about how to build a pizza oven, and like time to build the video. And then I had $7,500 that was in the pot, and then that allowed me to pay for the material to, to do the pizza oven. So that's just kind of uh, a way to work the system. And the SARE people are nodding in affirmation, so I didn't do anything that sketchy. So, um, so yeah, that's kind of all I'll say on that. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about our CSA. I'm, I'm really grateful for that presentation. It's going to save me some time. And we're just kind of doing a 10-minute intro. And I, I like dialogue better. And you all seem like that kind of group, too. So we'll kind of get into it. Um, so we're a nonprofit, so that's a little bit unique. Um, we're in the city of Grand Rapids, so that's a little bit unique. Uh, we now have three growing sites. So we are growing in the city on about a third of an acre, and then we're growing outside of the city um, on about an acre and a half on one site and an acre and a half on another site. This is a really long story that I don't want to get into as to why that's the case. Um, but we're about a 250 member CSA. Um, we run it as a social enterprise, so we're trying to cover the majority of our costs so that we can do youth employment um, in the city. So we'll have 20 youth that will come and work on our farm or in our cafe. And then the farm revenue kind of helps pay for that. Um, we gross about $140,000 a year through our CSA. Um, and then we also have a pop-up cafe. So we recently purchased an old um, 1890s farmhouse and we renovated that, put a commercial kitchen in. I had to build another pizza oven because of a long story I don't want to get into. Um, basically, be careful if you work with churches because sometimes your values might change. Um, and so then, had to build a new pizza oven, a new pop-up cafe, and so now we have a new location. So, um, And that kind of goes over a lot of what I said, and, and that's our urban location. Oh, I'll just also say um, another kind of unique feature of, of our farm is we're working with low-income food access sites, um, so about 25% of our produce is going to them. And I'm talking tomorrow afternoon about kind of a, a farm-to-pantry CSA model that we've been piloting for the last two years, so you can kind of get in on that. Um, we are also one of the first farms in the state of Michigan to be able to do EBT for our farm shares, so it's like food stamps. Um, and then we do that with Double Up Food Bucks um, so that low-income customers can use their bridge card to buy a share at 50% off on a weekly basis. And, Amanda over there is who you want to talk to if you want to do that. 
Um, I just want to talk about this as a way of kind of maybe holding some ideas or concepts about how we're thinking about our CSA. So I listened to a Farmer to Farmer podcast. Um, I don't know if people do that anymore. It was Chris Blanchard, but that was like maybe three or four years ago. I felt like every farmer was listening to them when they were weeding. Um, and I don't remember the farmer that did this podcast, so I'm supposed to give credit to somebody that I don't know to give credit for, but they talked about having these three C's that they were thinking about when they were thinking about their CSA. Y'all are nodding. Do you, you remember who it was? It was three, so I added two, so there's some originality here. Um, but the first three was convenience, um, connection, and cost. So y'all were just talking about connection the whole, the whole time, right? So that's a really big one. And then I added uh, choice and character. And I'm just going to kind of go through like how we kind of think about them on our farm. And that might be just like a helpful rubric for y'all to think about your particular context. Like, how are you hitting on some of these concepts and then um, kind, of, kind of connect it to your own particular environment? Um, this is the first slide is just to talk about retention, which you already talked about. I feel like you don't need to think about this your first two or three years as a farm because you're just selling stuff to your friends, mainly. Like your first year, it's like the 25 people who know you. They're your friends and your family. And then it's like the next year is like, oh, okay, you didn't totally screw it up. They'll tell their friends and family, like, this is actually legit. You'll get to 50. You'll probably be okay to go up to 75. And then you're gonna start having problems. Like year three or year four, if you don't have your retention right, you're gonna start having problems because you gotta find that many new people every single time. And so y'all are not in your head, but you get up to like 400 like y'all are. We have 250 members. You can see those numbers at the bottom. If I have a 60% retention rate, um, I gotta find 90 new people every single year. And then it, you, you wanna lower that number as much as possible because that's a lot of people to burn through on a yearly basis. Um, and so then connection, I'm not gonna talk about, very much at all about this because y'all basically just talked about it, but do everything that they just told you to do if you're a farmer thinking about vegetables and you don't have time, then trade a share with somebody who wants to do that um, or find somebody who wants to do that kind of work on your behalf. Um, and then uh, some other things like you pick. We, we are in the city, so we love doing you pick. That's a great way to connect to, to your customer. Um, have a work day at your site. That's another way to kind of connect to your customer. Um, we're really big on our pickup site. I'll show some, some photos of that. Um, of where, be present the whole time. Make sure that somebody really enjoys being there. Like if you're the tired farmer, then you're just so tired, you just weeded everything and whatever, and you're cranky, then find somebody who isn't cranky to connect with your customers, <laughs> like for real. Like you gotta do that. Um, and then a newsletter, we used to do the weekly newsletter thing. We don't do that anymore. It, it took way too much time, but if you, how else are you connecting digitally? Um, do stuff in the off season, like do an off season cooking class when you aren't super busy, like in January, like try to do a cooking class if you have a context or environment. How can you upload as much of, of that work in January and February so it takes care of itself throughout the season? Um, and then we also are, are lucky in that we do have a commercial kitchen on site now and we have this pop-up cafe and then that is really replace a lot of the need to do any of those other things because people are eating pizza on our farm on a weekly basis. So we're connecting and they're buying things, and so that's really the ideal situation. Um, and so these are just some photos of work days or you pick. Um, this is uh, what the inside of this new farmhouse looks like and uh, some of our youth employees who, who run that. So obviously those, those three students are doing the connecting on our behalf, so I don't, I don't have to do that because I am a cranky farmer most of the time. Um, and then that's just a picture of our new pizza ovens. Um, we, if you go on the SARE site, you can see how we built our first oven. We, we did need to build new ones and built a double oven because uh, a pizza oven is a choke point. And so we need, we, we have, we're making 100 pizzas every single Thursday and we needed two ovens now to do that. Um, and then we also have community events. So this was a recent panel discussion um, that our youth staff led about racism and sexism in the food system. Um, and then they, we brought in all these speakers from the community to speak on that subject. And so that's another way, like um, uh, dinners that chefs can do, whatever it is that's getting people into your space. Um, and so then convenience. Connection to me is like what CSAs do extremely well. Like I mean, you, when you survey kind of product, like that's like the bread and butter of CSA. Convenience, I feel like, is what CSAs do the worst. 
Um, but there's, it's still really important, so be cognizant of that and like try to figure out how you can address that. But like, we're not open 24-7 like a grocery store. Like, we have very specific pickup times. They're in conflict with people's work schedules. Like, when you're asking people to sign up for a CSA, you are a major inconvenience in their life. Like, understand that, um, and then try to mitigate that as much as possible, because everybody wants things to be convenient. Um, so, like, don't get mad at that, but try to figure out how to address that. One of the ways we address that, we have a very long pickup time for CSA, so we go from 12 to 6.30. It used to be from 12 to 6, and then a lot of our customers are, were upset because they're coming home from work. And they're like, you know, there's traffic in the city, like we can't get to your site on time, so we had to bring it farther out to 6.30. That's a cost to us, but it's, it's a really important thing to consider. So how else can you make your CSA convenient? Um, we have this commercial kitchen now, and so we have um, value-added soups now that we're making. So our chef is making soups with whatever's in season. That's become hugely popular to our CSA share customers. They're on a Thursday picking up their vegetables, they're not gonna go home and make a meal from scratch. And so like, here's a jar of soup, they feel really good about that, and they can go home, it's a $10 for a quart jar, they return the quart jars, it's a really nice looped system. If you don't have a commercial kitchen, there's a lot of other food entrepreneurs out there that would probably enjoy that market, and so connect with them and figure out the logistics of like, what's the local restaurant in town, or who's a new up and coming food business, so that you could offer that product to create more convenience for them. Make pickup a joy, not a chore. If this is the most inconvenient part of their week, which it probably is, it better be a fun part of their week. Um, like if you're asking me to do something inconvenient, like make sure that like they are connecting with you, you're sharing a story with them, like they're laughing with the other shareholders that they're interacting with, or it will just be an inconvenience. Um, online ordering, like we used to try to save money on not having to pay Square to do every single interaction and stuff like that. Like, but make sure that purchasing is just easy. The 3% that you have to pay Square or whatever point of sale provider that you have is worth it. It will make your system of signing people up easier. Um, we had to figure out uh, CSA for COVID. So we stumbled upon drive through pickup. So the way we do this is we have a Google form that goes out to our shareholders on Tuesday. It has what's available that week. We offer choice to our customers, which I'll talk about in a second, but there's generally about five to six choices in that Google form that they then select off of. It then just becomes like a, a thing that we print an Excel sheet basically after we sort it, cut it in slices, put it on a brown paper bag, um, and then basically that's how we box our share. We put it in a brown paper bag. People drive through and then we give them the bag. We had to do that all through COVID to figure that out because we have a very market style pickup and now we have a hybrid style um, where we were having a, a in-person pickup that looks like a farmer's market or they can do the drive-through thing. And about half, our, half of our customers do drive-through now and the other half want to have that face-to-face -face interaction, want to go through the line. And then people forget to fill out the forms so then the, the other way is a way to kind of back that up. And we also partner with the local bakery um, to sell baked goods that customers can purchase ahead in advance. So like we don't even do all of that value added stuff in house. And so you could figure out a way to do that. Um, this is just what our pickup looks like. I'm baking that people eat with their eyes, not with their mouse. Um, and so I'm a big, big proponent of like your CSA should have a lot of aesthetic to it. So we like renovated this old coop building like hang up the lights, make the board look really nice. When you go to a farmer's market, it looks like this all the time because all the, everybody knows when you're in that competitive environment, if your, your booth doesn't look good, people aren't gonna buy stuff. But then you do your CSA and it's just like a box on a, like a table with no tablecloth on it and like in a parking lot. And it's like, like y'all, like you know this at the farmer's market, like why are you treating your most valued customers poorly? So I'm a big fan, it should look good, and then those are just the, the drive-through pickups in the back. And then that's how they look, and COVID, they had to hold up a sign with their last name because we couldn't even like breathe on each other through a window or whatever. Um, and then costs, so obviously we all are always thinking about costs all the time. I think CSA is actually the cheapest way to eat local, so that's a real asset. So like, I think CSA is good at costs, it's good at connection. We're terrible at convenience, so like, own that part of it. I think a lot of times farmers are struggle with that a little bit. Like, and so we kind of would put out there like, 
oh, this is a 25% discount off of the farmer's market prices. And like other farmers would be like, why are you telling them it's a discount? It's like, you're, they're not valuing the produce. And I'm like, what are you all talking about? It is a 25% discount. Like, why wouldn't you own that and be excited about that and make them know, like, if you're gonna be this valued customer, we're gonna give you a 25% discount in monetary value. Um, whether or not you do that or not, I, I don't know. But whatever discount you're giving, I'm assuming a CSA customer is getting some kind of discount, name that, so they feel good about that. Um, and then for that CSA, we have all of our shareholders box their own stuff other than now that we do the drive-through thing. But figure out ways that you can kind of cut corners because of that so that you don't have to put all like, the two pounds of carrots in a bag. Like they can do that for themselves. Um, other ways that you can make packing quicker and easier. Um, and then we also accept the EBT and double up food books like I said earlier. I mean, so then choice. Um, we're really big into choice on the farm too. So. Uh, we don't have a choice for everything on our farm, but we have a choice on certain things. Um, and I'm going to show you, this is a bunch of survey data that um, Garrett actually helped us with um, from our extension person. Um, and we did like a really, really extensive, every single crop that we grew, like, did we give you too much, did we give you just right, or did we give you too little? And I wanted... I wanted whatever it was that we were growing, if it was beets, like 70% should say that we were giving just the right amount. And we went through every single one, and then it's like, where did we grow too much? Where did we grow too little? And the most interesting thing about all that surveying was like beets or Brussels sprouts. Like 25% said we gave them too many beets, 25% said we gave them too little, and it was the same with Brussels sprouts. So, like, what on earth do you do with that? So, we started calling those vegetables our love or hate vegetables. Like, if grandma ruined beets or Brussels sprouts with you, for you, which is like, y'all know if that's generally the story with beets and Brussels sprouts, like grandma pickled them or she just cooked the crap out of them or whatever, like I am not gonna convince you to get over that trauma unless you have a lot of food counseling or whatever it is. <laughs> so like stop trying to convince that customer like over and over and over again to like that vegetable, which they're just not gonna like. Give them a choice. It could be even as simple as, do you want a bundle of beets or do you want a bundle of Brussels sprouts? It's like, give them that choice and that pickup. Um, and so on our website, it has this little thing on the right. Um, one of our youth employees made that one winter when we, we had time. And we, we split our, our vegetables into choosers. So beets and Brussels sprouts are quintessential choosers. Like if you are into beets, like you are into them, um, and Brussels, or you really hate them, and then you have your staples, they're like your potatoes, your carrots, your tomatoes. You don't need to give them to a customer and give them a choice. Like almost everybody eats those, so you don't need to make that a complicated part of your CSA. Then we have exotic, which is like the fennel, the kohlrabi, um, the things that are really weird. And so then I always want the choosers and the exotic to be part of a choice. So a lot of times the exotic are part of like a quadrant of choices. Like do you want bok choy, do you want fennel, do you want kohlrabi? They all are basically taking up the same amount of space on a crop plan. It's a pretty easy crop to give a choice on. Um, and so that's kind of how we manage that. Um, and then the last C is character. This is my attempt to make the word quality mean C. <laughs> and then actually when I thought about it more, it actually is a pretty good word. Um, and so quality, I just meant, I originally when I was thinking about it, it's like you need to know how to grow broccoli, like for real. Like, Figure that out, because broccoli's hard, or cauliflower, like that purple cauliflower that y'all showed a picture of, like that's a farm because you got purple cauliflower, you're like that, yeah, you want to show that photo. Um, <laughs> there's some hard ones, like do your work to try to figure those out. Those will take time, I mean like, a, that, that could take you three or four years to get your soil right to get cauliflower like that. Um, but when you get it, you're gonna post that one, I know. Um, but then be proud of that, but so that's part of it, right? But this is a picture of somebody on social media where we did this uh, butterhead lettuce thing, and she took it home and put it in a vase and put it on her countertop and posted it, which is like gold on the whole connection thing, right? But it's like, who on earth would go to Meyer or whatever store y'all do in Indiana? You have Meyer down here? Yeah. Okay. Um, like, I've never seen anybody take home stuff from the grocery store and put it on their counter and take a picture of it and post it. Like, that's absurd. That would be very irrational behavior, but it's totally, it makes total sense from a CSA perspective, right? <laughs> and so like our, our produce has a character to it that's beyond even just high quality. So it is the baller purple cauliflower, like, but it's also like there's a story behind their food, so there's a, a high level of character behind it. So 
Like kind of own that and kind of know that that's an important part of your product. Um, and then similarly, kind of, that's my baller broccoli post, just to throw back at the purple cauliflower. I thought it was intentional. Um, but, you know, figure that out, but then make, make the, the pickup look, look good, too. Um, and then the, we have that added dynamic where, you know, we're doing this, this other value-added social thing of connecting with you. So that's also part of the story. But each farm, like, y'all are all working hard. You have cool families. Like, you all have a lot of character behind your food. So tell that story. Like, make, make a story be part of that food experience. So. Specifically about the youth, I also work with the youth. And you said the grant had just ended a couple of days ago. Which particular grant was that? Yeah, so there's, uh, it's called a SARE Youth Educator Grant. And so I think the maximum award now is 6,000 for that. And um, basically, yeah, you're just gonna write whatever narrative, how you're connecting with those youth, how you're teaching them about sustainable agricultural practices. And yeah, so it's, it's a fairly quick application to put together, so yeah. Okay, then the second question is, um, you mentioned you have an inner city garden and then you have the outside gardens. How far away are you from your rural gardens? We're about 30 minutes out, yeah. So it's, it's a bit of a challenge. We have a lot of automation out there. And then um, the, the off sites, so one of them is on um, the campus of a university. So it's Grand Valley State University. And they already have like a, a student farm there. And so there's a farm manager that kind of watches that, like if the curtains don't open and close or whatever. We just basically kind of grow crops that kind of are low touch points for mm -hmm. us, where we don't kind of need to touch them two or three times a week. And then the stuff that's like the cilantro or the, the really finicky stuff or the cut greens, we're growing those in the city intentionally. Okay, and how do you go about funding your youth that work on the farms? Um, so the social enterprise you know, generates a majority of the cost for the program. So mm -hmm. we are generating that 140,000 in revenue that's paying for two full-time adult staff at costs, and then we're paying out about twenty-five to 30000 in youth employment wages. So they work with us three days a week in the summer, so 18 hours a week. Some youth will return on their second year, and then they become managers of a specific thing at that point, and then we'll help co-manage their peers. And then we, we all are moving more into having young adult employees on us, with us as well. And so we'll have some outside grant funding that will then also support some of those additional positions. Yeah. Okay. We can talk more about that after too, for sure. Thanks, Carly. Um, Lance, I was wondering if you could talk more about some of the collaborative work you've done um, as with your farm and other like local nonprofits. Um, you know, projects you've worked on or how you've kind of benefited from those collaborative efforts um, with others in the community. Yeah, I would definitely add that to the equation. So. If, if you have an idea particularly that's socially minded, like if you're, you all are farming, like y'all are farming, like so find the entities that are existing in your community that you can collaborate with. So generally a good grant application already has collaboration in it. So a grant funder typically wants to see those collaborative relationships, but like go to your local community foundation, like show up for whatever networking events are kind of happening. Like being here is an important thing to do, but then connect to your extension people. So like Garrett's kind of like my extension person that I connect with a lot. A lot of people in our area that are writing apps will like kind of clue Garrett in. So this is an application that's being written. And so there could be these big pots of money that are getting passed around and they're looking for partners. And then if you're networked, then you get invited into a project. And then like kind of the ideal spot to be is in when you have like somebody who has a full-time grant writer, somebody who has like somebody who does all the reporting on a, a normal basis. So these farmer rancher grants are easy ones in the grant world. And then the other ones is like a whole other thing. Um, and like, I think like 40% of farmer rancher grants gets funded. Like that's a good application to write. In the normal grant writing world, like 10% if you're lucky. And like, you gotta have all the cool buzzwords. You kinda have to already be known by the grant reviewers. It's like this whole other thing. And so unless you're jumping in on some of those collaborative relationships, like it's kind of like honestly like a waste of your time. And so like you kind of do want to know your extension people, you want to you want to network, you want to collaborate if you're trying to get into more of the nonprofit world or the grant writing world. Um, so I don't know if that's helpful or kind of answers your question. But. Thank you so much farmers for your time. Appreciate it.